saw the thumbnail. You saw the title. Xbox world is in shambles right now. Damage control is happening everywhere. Things are scattering about. Big news has leaked. Probably the biggest leak that we've seen from maybe a major entity in gaming. Maybe not like a singular publisher, but we we see it all currently. And if you're behind, of course, this entire year, last two years, we've constantly been talking about the FTC and Xbox, FTC and Xbox in this. Or, and I, I'm sorry, not even the FTC specifically. That's only recently. But of course, we've been talking about Xbox with the Federal Trade Commission, with the CMA in Europe, with et cetera, et cetera. These different things coming out as they present their case on why they should buy ABK, of course, Activision, Blizzard King. This all crescendos into what we have now. Now, of course, there's been great stories, big news stories repeatedly when these things were happening. But now it's as if a golden platter was given to us as the entire docket of their legal proceedings has been leaked. It uh, was on accident, obviously. Um, and it was on accident, of course, it was leaked by Microsoft themselves as they uploaded the documents but was not properly uh, redacted in any way at all. Nothing was taken out. They just put up raw, raw info for all to see. Uh, so we uh, get a feast for our eyes, frankly, and get to piece through all of the discussions, all of the pieces of uh, intel that, that has been found out from this lot of surprising things. A lot of things not very surprising, but I think I've delayed enough. Let's get into it, as this, of course, isn't an emergency Easy Cheers game. I don't normally come to you on a tuesday it is but i mean it demands it am i correct this it demands an episode this giant again historic leak i would say i think in hindsight we're gonna look at this and be like wow we we really learned a lot uh not only from the entire happenings of the ftc but this specific leak right here before we get into leak i do want to quickly surmise a very quick story that is related to everything. Uh, earlier, I was going to do this in the show just in case I don't do a regular show this week. Maybe this eats up all the news. Who knows? I didn't want to go over that the Game Pass uh, numbers were leaked through a LinkedIn resume. And we can see that that there are over 30 million members right now on Game Pass. That is an interesting number to know. That is something to Keep in mind, as that is going to be relevant in a lot of this, what we're going to be discussing, just keep in mind that they're up to about 30 million. A lot of this was in the last year to two, so it could have been, you know, 20 million number for a lot of that. Now, I have a lot of. I mean, I look this Google Doc looks like a psychopath made it. I pieced a lot of things together. A lot of things are documents. Some of this is going to be on the fly. You do have to forgive me. I, I chose speed over preparation with this episode, as I did want to discuss all of this with everyone, with you, of course, at home. Let me know if this is something you would rather me just take my time right, full, full right outs for. But this seems to demand immediacy rather than I take a full day and a half to just completely write all this out. So stick with me, get together. Let's go on as... Please forgive me. There might be cuts. There might be times where I go, um, well, I, you know, look at something or I go have to, you know, look at this other sheet that I have. Bear with me here. I figured it was fitting to start with something that has happened in the past many times. Uh, and we see that it's still a thing that's happening in the culture. Microsoft, if you do not know, wanted to buy Nintendo when they were entering the console business. That was their first thought. Right. It wasn't to start Xbox. The original thought was, hey, let's just buy Nintendo and that'll be our thing. They go executives fly to Japan and have a meeting with Nintendo themselves. And you can look up this story. It's an amazing story. Uh, it's a giant story. You can, I'm sure, find somewhere. And they quite literally were laughed out of them. They had a whole presentation. They were talking. 
and it's not a joking laugh out of room. The man literally says it is hard to get through a presentation when they are literally laughing at you. And so like they were quite literally laughed out of the room when they came to try and buy a Nintendo. And who do we see that is still trying to buy Nintendo? Microsoft, of course. Now, this is a email from Phil Spencer to Chris Copacelli and Takeshi Nomoto. Now, let me quickly grab Chris. Chief Marketing Officer at Microsoft is Chris Capello. And then Takeshi Nomoto. I don't recognize that name. Takeshi Nomoto. Can't find him quickly, so I won't delay us too long. So, he writes... Takeshi, I totally agree that Nintendo is the prime asset for us in gaming. And today, gaming is our most likely path to consumer relevance. I've had numerous conversations with the LT, LT of Nintendo about tighter collaboration, and I feel like if any U.S. company would have a chance with Nintendo, we are probably in the best position. The unfortunate, and in the parentheses, or fortunate for Nintendo, in parentheses, situation is that Nintendo is sitting on a big pile of cash. They sure are. They have a BOD that until recently has not pushed for further increases in market growth or stock appreciation. I say until recently, as our former Microsoft board, uh, BOD member, board of directors, sorry, I should just say board of directors, uh, Value Act has been heavily acquiring shares of Nintendo. Interesting. And I've kept in touch with Masson Morfit as he's been acquiring. It's likely he will be pushing for more from Nintendo stock, which could create opportunities for us. Without that catalyst, I don't see an angle to a near-term, mutually agreeable merger of Nintendo and Microsoft, and I don't think a hostile action would be a good move. In s move. So we are playing the long game, but our board of director has seen the full write-up on Nintendo and Valve, in parentheses, and they are fully supported on either if opportunity arises, as am I. Now, there's a another paragraph that we're about to hit. I want to take a second to quickly go over that. Of course, talking about a board of director on the thing, saying he's going to push for more shares and all these things. He's heavily acquiring. Says we, he sees an avenue in there. I, I'm, I'm not the biggest guy. It does seem semi-illegal that he's like, well, we could use an inside man buying things, but it's not illegal. I, that That is more of a believe a like hostile action. Um, and there's nothing wrong with like buying shares and then asking someone be like, well, I have someone that can help you out. That's actually 10 cents slash the Chinese Communist Party's move. And a lot of things they kind of go to companies buy a bunch of shares, sometimes golden, and they'll sit there and be like, you need some money and you know they'll do things like that to to breach their way more and more in we see that of course right here that he is saying without a further doubt it's like yeah no we could go in there but it is not the right time as you know they have money they don't need anything they don't need anything from a uh western studio slash western uh xbox western gaming company right they they're very happy doing the nintendo thing and they have a very japanese culture over there that does not agree with a lot of things one microsoft does two microsoft says and three there's just an entire cultural landscape that they do right and they they govern and just does not agree with how nintendo runs i find it very amusing that uh that someone's like yeah we see it's the prime asset but uh it's, it's not easy. It's easier said than done to try and buy them. Now, let's go back into this email. Confidentially, we have two fairly active mergers and acquisition discussions in gaming right now. Warner Brothers Interactive and ZeniMax. I took ZeniMax to the board of directors last week, and prior to the board of director decision, I asked Amy and, Sat and Satya, Sat Satya, I believe is how you pronounce it, Satya Nabella, the CEO of Microsoft, if they wanted me to slow either or both of these, given the TikTok discussions, which I believe he is referencing to the TikTok discussions of the. Oh, wait, no, no, sorry. I think actually they were trying to buy and it's uh, Microsoft was going to buy TikTok back then. Yes, I'm pretty sure that that's what was happening. That they were going to buy TikTok around this time, Microsoft themselves, and then they got out of that, I, I believe. Pretty sure that's correct. Let me know in the comments. 
And they both emphatically told me no. They are fine doing all three of these if the deals make sense. I won't say Warner Brothers or Zenny is Nintendo, but both are for sale. And getting by us if things are both are for sale and getting by us if things align. Biggest obstacle in WB is IP ownership. We wouldn't own any of the IP, which hurts long-term flexibility. And the only obstacle on Zenny is the value expectations of founders. But I think it's likely one or both of these happen both of these happen which will help us continue to double down on our gaming relevance to give a sense of scale cinemax is about to size is about is about the size of our current first party studios organization so that would be doubling our content assets downside is it's more core less broad not mobile more north american and european and he ends it with etc he puts i love this discussion value looking opinions at some point getting nintendo would be a career moment and i honestly believe a good move for both companies it's just taking a long time for nintendo to see that their future exists off of their off of their own hardware a long time dot 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 with a little smiley face at the end i mean wow it's, it's it is pretty shocking that they still look at nintendo as this thing that they should buy and from a raw hey like a raw point of view of like hey i'm one of the board of directors yes of course buying nintendo is the end all be all but just the just to see the how they talk about it where he's like yeah it would be a career move i mean sure yeah phil it would be uh i will i have to admit i would not love a nintendo under microsoft move just because i love nintendo being its own thing and I just can't imagine Microsoft just letting Nintendo be their own thing anymore. And again, there's just that huge disparity between the two, right? I don't think a Nintendo would ever really be interested in being fully owned by a Western um, company like that. Especially, and it's not like they, they dislike, dislike like the West or anything. It's just a, such a different culture and the way they look at things i just don't see them doing that but hey maybe i can't imagine the ftc i mean they were questioning activision blizzard there's zero chance this happens now there is no there's no way that they let that happen that if activision blizzard was even a case to bring up nintendo is a no, th that would actually probably be 100% blocked. They would they would have to wait a very long time for fires to settle, for even broaching a topic of this nature with with them uh, speaking specifically about Nintendo. Maybe, you know, they could get smaller things, but Nintendo, the, one of the three in gaming. Now, you can argue, if we see in movies, Disney bought 20th Century Fox, which I thought was kind of gross but they just let that happen so you could argue that why wouldn't microsoft you know why wouldn't they just let microsoft buy that i don't know movies are so different so it's hard for me to speak specifically on that but i cannot imagine a court being like yeah no this seems this seems all right but hey who knows uh i will say i am a little proud of myself at the time, this is an old Easy Achievers episode. So I don't blame anyone for, one, not remembering, two, not no, not watching, because no one watched back then. I said they were going to buy Warner Brothers around the time they bought ZeniMax. So I had a crazy theory that they were cutting costs back then. If you remember, they were cutting costs, they closed the mixer, and there was a couple other things that they did. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. But I said, I think they're buying Warner Brothers because AT&T was looking to offload. Um, was that was looking to get some cash pretty much to offset some of the loans and these things. Uh, AT&T had these giant. Uh, I want to say it was, yeah, just giant loans that they had to pay down or something. I can't remember now, but they were looking for cash. And I was like, well, they buy WB now. And it's clear now that one, that was happening and two, why it didn't happen. Right. So th those were in discussions for sure. 
I 100% believe if they took that, they there was a D on the table and Microsoft walked away from it. One, and this is pretty crazy. He says, I'll read it one more time. Quote, biggest obstacle in WB is IP ownership. We wouldn't own any of the IP, which hurts long-term flexibility and the only obstacle of Zenny is value, expectations, etc. That is pretty crazy to me. Warner Brothers wanted to completely... They were they wanted to sell studios and not lose any IP. Now, think about it this way. That doesn't make zero sense, right? Of course, they're not you're not buying Batman when you buy WB game studios, right? But if this is to believe at face value, they couldn't even work in Batman gaming rights for X amount of years, et cetera, et cetera, which is pretty crazy. Now it seems obvious that they are looking to sell studios and nothing else. We will sell the people, the places. You're not getting anything else. You're not getting the games. You're not getting the, the IP generation of any of this. You are not getting anything else but these studios. And clearly that was not good enough for Microsoft. They stepped away. I can't blame them. I probably wouldn't take it either. I'm just shocked that WB, again, needed cash at the time. I'm sure they're fine now, but they needed cash. There wasn't a deal they could work with to try and get Batman gaming rights for X amount of Harry Potter gaming rights for X amount of years. I don't know that they, I'm sure they don't necessarily regret it now, of course, with Hogwarts legacy being the giant success it is, but, and of course, uh, more combat one and et cetera, but pretty crazy. I, I'm surprised they couldn't make that work. Now they would have got moving on. There's a, there's another thing we can get to as well. So, uh, this is so from Chris Capet. So this was chief uh, officer or whatever. And this is to Takeshi Nomoto. Uh, so it says, great thoughts. This isn't a reply. Great thoughts. TikTok has really fallen to our laps rather than being something we actively sought out for our customer business. If you said, what is the best customer asset that we should spend 10 to $30 billion on? It's crazy. It's so casually talked about. I don't think we'd say it's TikTok, but the stars have aligned to give us a chance, so we should look hard at pursuing it. As you know, for each of the solution areas, we have to we sorry we have a set of companies we'd love to acquire if the timing and terms are right. They of course have to be willing to sell, and they have to see us as a top company to sell to, like Mojang did. TikTok has not been a, any of these lists, so I think it's important to realize the current discussions are ones that develop due to geopolitical dynamics. And the good fortune we have with a strong trusted brand that make TikTok look to us as a way to avoid being shut down out of the U.S. market by the current administration. You can you can argue if it wasn't on any of our lists, why are we entertaining the idea? But I think we never envisioned that this could really be possible. And this big acquisition opportunities comes along so rarely that we and it ends. Not nothing much uh, said there aside from getting a little insight of how casually they they're just saying like 10 to 30 billion dollars on. I do remember slightly that TikTok was going to be banned for a while uh, and there was a whole bill about it and didn't pass, but they're going to ban it. And Microsoft's like, well, we'll buy it and keep it on the market or whatever. I don't know. Goes to show you that Microsoft is no slush. It's just being like, we'll just buy it. Like, that, that, that's such... It seems almost like their culture at this point where it's just like, we have money, let's spend it, which, I mean, I guess, so why not? Do your thing. Off of that, we go to some remaster leaks, not even remaster leaks, just video game leaks. Two very big things here. Technically three if you're encountering just per uh, number value, but let's talk about this. So. There was a title release schedule leak on top of uh, a lot of these documents. This is everything from specifically uh, Bethesda Softworks. So, not sorry, not Bethesda Softworks. Sorry, Zenimax slash, you know, Bethesda Softworks. Uh, all of that. This is everything expected from them f uh, until fin uh, financial year 2024. This is everything. Now, this is cut up in console slash PC and free to play and mobile. Now, I'm going to skip until we get to 2024 because we know everything and we know everything there is to know about 2023 so i'm just gonna go straight to uh 2024 
yeah, we know we know all this, obviously, and, and the year's about to be over, so it's not really relevant. Now, we start with Elder Scrolls Six, which hilarious. Project Kestrel. And again, remember, this is this is uh, this was made in 2020. So this is all expected to release. Project Kestrel expansion, licensed IP game, Fallout 3 remastered, Elder Scrolls Online expansion, Ghostwire Tokyo sequel, Dishonored 3, Doom Year Zero DLC, which is interesting because they do not have... No, they do have the Doom Eternal DLC. So I'm curious what Doom Year Zero is. It's also put in financial year 2023, which is Doom Year Zero. It's very interesting what that means. And then, uh, oh, and, and going back to this, yeah, Project Kestrel expansion. They also have Project Kestrel in 2023, which I don't know. What is that off top? I can't, I don't know what that is off top. Don't think we know, do we? I think we can figure out through like deduction, probably. But I don't have the time. Project is to believe it be there's also a license. Yeah, so we don't know. The roadmap Kestro is believed to be a new online game that has been developed for over this is via tech spot for over four years at Zenimax Online Studios. There's also a licensed IP game set for release in the next which is probably Indiana Jones. And it seems that that's a yeah, 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 so it's important. Okay, so heading back to this. Okay, and then going back to this 2024 Elder Scrolls 6 Project Kestrel expansion license IP game Fallout 3 remaster Elder Scrolls Online expansion Ghostwire Tokyo sequel Dishonored 3 Doom Year Zero DLC and then there's one planned free to play slash mobile title in this year as well. Now, remember, we were supposed to get whatever Doom Year Zero 3 is this year, assuming it was delayed or whatever that is. So that was that's been postponed, I, I assume, to next year. And again, you have to remember all this is in that in the sight of like a 2020 docket that was made pretty much. So we have to think about it that way. And also what's funny is if you remember Starfield was delayed. Starfield was expected to come out fi fiscal year of um 2021, <laughs> which is pretty funny. And the next year they were already going to have DLC out, which is I mean, wow. Redfall, of course, also slated for that year as well. For that 2021 year, all that was, of course, delayed uh, to this year. Of course, Redfall was at the very beginning of this year. And then Star imagine Redfall if it came out in 2021. Oh, my God. Now, Starfield delayed two years uh, for obvious reasons because they had money. So they were like, yeah, no, we don't need to release this. The Starfield released, of course, very recently. Uh, if you move the timelines, we'll get Starfield DLC sometime next year. Nothing crazy there. I'm sure everyone knows that. But of course, the big story is Elder Scrolls 6 coming out originally next year. Haha, -ha, that's very funny. Uh, that was never probably going to happen. Uh, it goes to show you that a lot of this is, you know, this is the plan, but it's not actually going to happen. Uh, and then the Fallout 3 remasters and uh, Elder Scrolls Oblivion remasters of course are planned to come out what's more interesting is they already have a ghostwire tokyo sequel now uh sorry in internally announced and getting ready to come out which is pretty interesting because uh, as far as i understand it's sold pretty soft i know it, of course has game pass numbers all over it and these things but that's shocking dishonor 3 uh i'm happy for the people for that that's going to get their dishonor 3 game they're gonna be very excited and yeah that's pretty much it wanted to make sure i didn't miss anything no okay i didn't and now more uh to keep with that hold on where was oblivion in this sorry let me give me one second oh oh there it was so it was the financial year 2022 oblivion remaster was supposed to come out la the year before so was indiana jones which is pretty hilarious so i've missed that in this original thing so oblivion remaster is supposed to come out last year didn't so it's coming out this year um and now or not this year sorry next year and so is that elder scrolls oblivion remaster that's going to come out sometime next year which we already i believe knew that it was already leaked that that was happening i believe so it's not 
incredibly shocking. I'll be very excited. Next year is going to be dope because we're we're going to be getting a Fallout 3 in Sky Oblivion Remaster. I remember covering on the show that they're like using some Unreal Engine 5 things in the game, I think, to like remaster items, something like that. I can't I can't remember the exact story, but that is relevant there. And of course, uh, Elder Scrolls 6 was uh, supposed to come out fiscal year of 2024, which is pretty funny. Now, let's move on to an important note. Another thing that came out was a whole docket basically saying here are the exclusives in Bethesda. Here are the games that were are and they're pretty much brackets like describing the situation kind of. So, for instance, Deathloop is on here. Deathloop then goes to is an existing IP. It says no multiplayer game. Yes. Cross platform console play. No released on PlayStation. And it says yes. Release date was 9 14 2021 platforms that's going to be available on was playstation and pc right so that's pretty much the format now of course we have that ghostwire Fallout 76 elder scrolls online starfield redfall elder scrolls 6 now we're gonna skip all that of course because we know everything else about the other games we're gonna get to the juices of elder scrolls 6 blah 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 we don't care obviously it's not a multiplayer game obviously there will not be console play now here's the thing release on playstation has the red x says no very very interesting so we now know for sure internally they are saying hell no Elder Scrolls 6 is an xbox exclusive of course platforms available it does say xbox pc release date to uh, is tbc so i'm assuming it's like you know to be to to be announced pretty much but expected 2026 or later right not shocking for anyone this thing was nowhere close to coming out we have another three years until we see Elder Scrolls 6 not surprising to me. I'm assuming not surprising to many out there. Three years. I know sounds like a long time, but remember, this is Bethesda. And now they have the infinite money of Microsoft, like, kind of on their backs. So they're just chilling, like, yeah, we'll make it. You know, now we can take really take our times. So we have to worry about making cash. We're just going to make it when we want to, pretty much, you know? Uh, and here is Microsoft's statement on exclusivity. Um, That was also a bracket. I didn't cover that. This is a bracket. I'm going to read that for the Elder Scrolls 6 section. In order to be on Xbox, I want us to be able to bring the full complete package of what we have. And that would be true when I think about Elder Scrolls 6. Now, I believe that was the statement from an interview with GQ. I think I want to say that's true. Um, it was an interview with somebody and he said those very specific words. I'm pretty sure that's true. Anyways. <clears throat> we have had quite let me get a sip of water real quick feel free to take a sip uh, if you're driving do the thing where you know you got one hand in the wheel don't close your eyes you know do, you do the thing where you turn your head a little bit you sip while you're watching the road you know do one of those oh i've been going pretty hard for 29 minutes needed a little a little rinse wet the whistles what they say never understood that saying what the whistle sounds i mean i'm I'm going to say it sounds inappropriate. It sounds sexual in nature, right? L let me wet the whistle. Don't say that. Don't say that while making eye contact. You know what I mean? Or do. You know what I'm saying? Now, I know you're at home saying like, ah, this is the biggest leak in history. I don't know. You, you kind of covered things that are cool, but biggest leak in history. Uh, now, if you've missed it, of course, you've seen the title. So I know, you know. We're talking about the next system to be released by Xbox. Now, technically... It's systems. Let's discuss. Now, we have a hybrid kind of thing that they're happening. This is pretty much their slim version, I believe. Yes. Her, no, no. So this is... These are two different things. So this is uh, this is via Stephen Sadeo. I found this very specifically. Microsoft vision for its next console is a quote hybrid gaming platform end quote targeting 2028 with an OS that would work on customer devices or handhelds. This is of course via FTC stuff. Now, if this is where I found the picture here, I'm going to read to you verbatim what it says. Now there are different things here. So I will try and piece out what it what like what everything means our vision 
develop a next generation hybrid game platform capable of leveraging the combined power of the clients and cloud to developer to develop to sorry to deliver deeper immersion and entirely new classes of game experiences optimized for real time gameplay and creators we will enable new levels of performance beyond the capabilities of the client hardware alone so they're trying to say there will be more to do outside of just the system interesting kind of so key strategic decisions and in, in um investments this is for silicone and here is what everything says here so this will be q1 cy 2023 what does that mean cy uh, I don't know. cpu is uh oh, this is all a bunch of work i don't think anyone at home cares cpu arm 664 versus x64 zen 6 architecture i believe is is how you say that it's, it's in parentheses after that the balance of big and little CPU cores, the GPU co-design with AMD or licensed AMD IP, Navi 5 is in parentheses, NPU, I don't even know what that is, balancing the desire for flexibility programmable ML silicone versus high-performance silicone for targeted workloads, forward compatibility, forward compatibility, meaning this is a thing that will always work, meaning this is a thing that will stay compatible because it's using some sort of cloud engine graphics innovations next gen direct x ray tracing dynamic global illumination micro polygonal rendering optimizations ml based super resolution extensible model for faster iteration and innovation and then thin os lacking thin os for uh less than 99 dollar consumer or handheld devices a lot of wordy words there seems like they're trying to leverage some sort of device that is forwards compatible that you that is workable on other things that is this hybrid device that are that is like multiple things at once very confusing but i do while we're talking about hardware want to talk about the big thing that was leaked which is of course the system the games now, there are multiple things to talk about when we're talking about just the hardware. And I actually might bring up a lot of this to discuss. Hmm. Will I do that? I think I will. Hopefully this doesn't break anything. Let's see. All right. Nothing's broken yet. Give me one second. If you're on YouTube, you can, of course, watch this. If you're on audio, then you don't care. Okay. So. This is my Twitter. Give me a second. Let me click on that let me like close in on this because there is like too much noise on the sides here so i found all this via game pass tracker on twitter i refuse to call it anything else can't even really see it so i guess this is pointless i'm gonna go back to the other thing boom i'll read everything to you okay so this is i guess project brooklyn this is the xbox series x refresh it looks like a cylinder I did show quickly on the uh, screen. It will also be in the thumbnail, so you'll be able to see what it looks like. I mean, it looks like a cylinder. It literally looks like a trash can. One of my friends I know works at Apple said uh, it literally looks like a, I think he said it was called a Mac Pro that came out in 2013. Uh, and he actually hollowed that out and uses that as trash can at his office. Coolest thing ever. Anyways, I will read everything on this thing. It's very... Um, consumery very wordy pre garbage but you brace yourself all right so brooklyn xbox series x refresh the most powerful xbox ever now adorably all digital why do they say that brooklyn will deliver 4k gen 9 console gaming with more internal storage faster wi-fi reduced power a more immersive controller and a beautiful redesign that elevates the all digital experience on the xbox ecosystem now, there's one section. Giving our, fan, our fans more to love. Beautiful and innovative new design. It's just a cylinder. More internal storage for games. They expanded it to 2 terabytes, so it's now doubled. USB-C front port with power delivery. All new, more immersive controller. Same great price, $4.99. Updated technologies. All new Southbridge to modernize I.O. and sustain, sustainability efforts. Wi-Fi 6E radio for better throughput, latency, and interference mitigation. 
Bluetooth 5.2 radio for improved accessory experiences. 6NM die shrink for improved efficiency. Yeah, this is all French to me, so I don't understand a lot of this. Of course, I understand Wi-Fi. But... Improved sustainability. Reduced PSU power by 15%. New low power standby mode is 20% of current Xbox Series S standby mode. Increased use of PCR and housing to more than 30%. 100% recyclable pack packaging. Looks like they just wanted to add one more thing at the end there. Interesting. So we have a mid-gen refresh planned. Still no word on anything stronger, right? PlayStation still is coming out with PS5 Pro. Looks like the Series X is just going to be smaller. There's not going to be another system. Phil Spencer said he expects this to be the mid-gen refresh. The Series X is meant to be that. Okay. We'll see. I can't imagine that's going to play well, especially on the market. But who knows? Who knows? Quick thoughts, as I don't want to move away from this too quickly, but the design, I mean, it's cool. It's smaller. Again, it's digital, so you have to be okay with losing that disc. I speak from someone that rarely, and I'm, I'm talking rarely, uses discs. But... I like the option. I just like it there. I have to be honest with you. Now, I will say it's still $4.99, and it doesn't have a disk drive. Not the best. That is a big, big L, especially if PlayStation launches their refresh at a cheaper price. I don't think that's the plan, because I think the the Pro, assumably, will be 600 bucks. 700 i don't i don't know maybe it, it just takes the place of the ps5 now it'll be 499 and then the ps5 will be a uh the which will at that point will be the slim because it won't have a disk drive it'll be 399 so that'll be the two playstations maybe the ps5 pro will be 599 i i don't know what we're looking at in terms of how stronger things are and how that will represent on the market price of the thing. Sony seems like they're like, no, we're going to make money off this. So we're not, you know, they're going to want to make money. So I'm assuming it can't be $4.99. But who knows? This thing is going to be $4.99. And you're technically losing something. But you're also gaining, like, better power in these things. But that doesn't seem relative to a market value change. Or at least what the perceived consumer will look at the market. Um, the... <clears throat> Uh, market value or at least the the market price i should say is probably a better way of putting that seems strange that you're making it 4.99 and all you did from again a consumer point of view is you made it smaller and took away a disc right that's just not going to i think sit well people i'll be curious to see if they lower the price by the time this thing launches who really knows i don't i'm going to quickly show you the picture for that this is the new series s the exact same if you're on youtube you can quickly glance at your screen boom there you go switching back project elwood this is the xbox series s refresh this thing looks the exact same i don't think much is changing if you remember the black version is coming very soon so i'm assuming this is the same thing but in white and slightly better so Elwood will deliver Gen 9 console gaming with more internal storage, faster Wi-Fi, reduced power, more immersive controller, all for the same affordable. OK. So even more value, it says more internal storage for games at one terabyte, all new, more immersive controller, the same low price of two ninety nine. Let's get, we'll get back to that in a second. Update technologies, all new Southbridge to modernize I.O. and sustainability features, Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.2. So that's all the same. Improved sustainability. New low power standby mode is 20% of the current Xbox Series S standby. Increased use, so it's all the same thing. Increased use of PCR. So this is technically not getting a price increase at all. Technically, the Series S is because the way I look at it, you're losing something. So it's still more expensive than the Series S you're getting now. And you're not seeing a change in power. You're seeing a change in the literal power as in uh, electricity in these things so maybe you can argue that that could be you're paying for that or something and you'll see like i mean technically it will cost you less money for it to be on if it's on standby mode so uh you know pro cons i don't think we need to get that minute with it just interesting to bring up 
This thing, though, is saying $299. And we'll have the new controller that we're going to get to in just one second. So they're not increasing the other one at all, technically, but they are to me. They're also not increasing this one. So interesting that they're going all digital, right? There will not be a choice for a disc from a new system. Now, if this is like how the Xbox One was, we will still have the availability of both pretty well. If you think of the Xbox One S and Series X as a stand-in for the Xbox Series X as we see it now and the new refreshes, then maybe it's the same thing. And we'll have like a reliability of the old Xbox Series X at the same time. I don't know. I just don't see a reason why you would want to rush out and buy a Series X all uh, the refresh one. Because you get the same performance, a little bit more power. Sorry, a little more electricity usage with the old one. But you get the option of a disc, which you're just saying, like, you know, you never want to play a movie in there or something. I understand most people just do all digital, especially with movies and these things. But, like, I don't know. Just seems interesting that they're going all digital with this whole refresh. Let's go to the controller now. Now I'm going to show this again. If you want to look at it for a second. Pretty gnarly thing, if uh, if I say so myself. Let me make this a bit bigger. Sorry, Cheevers. I'm sure you cannot see this. I can barely see it on the little preview OBS screen. So sorry about that. Give me one second to expand it. It will probably be blurry, but you'll at least see it. Now, this is called Project Sibyle. Sibyl? This is the new Xbox controller. This thing looks... I don't know, like kind of toyish. Let me dissect my thoughts on this thing real quick. Uh, you know, no, let's talk about the controller first, what we see on the screen, and then we'll we'll talk we'll talk what my thoughts are. So I'll read everything again. <laughs> the new Xbox controller, the world's best controller, now playing on a screen near you. Jesus Christ! Ubiquity, play anywhere. Xbox Wireless Two, Direct the Cloud, Bluetooth Five Point Two. Those are all bullets. I don't know what Xbox Wireless 2 is. Seamless pair and switch. I think this is kind of interesting here. New mobile app features. See pair devices and cloud. That's pretty interesting. Manage devices and accessories. That's it's interesting. I'm, I'm curious what that means. Like it says seamless pair and switch. So will it know? Will my mobile app know? Like I can hit the button and the Xbox controller will immediately switch to my phone because that's pretty cool. I do use my iPad and phone every now and then for a for a screen experience. So that'd be pretty interesting if that is true. That is how I'm reading it that way. Anyways, uh, let's go. Let's go on to immersion. Feel the game. Precision haptic feedback. I wonder where they got that from. VCA haptics double S speakers. Interesting. So I'm curious, again, similar to the haptic control on PS5s. So I'm, curious, I'm I'm assuming the haptics in the thing will also make some sort of noise. Accelerometer, which I believe is the vibration, is what they call that. And then quieter buttons and thumbsticks. I heard this is an issue with some people that, like, the Xbox is loud or something. It's never been an issue with me, but, it, you know, there you go. It's quieter now. I've never hit a button and been like, oh, it's so loud, you know, so. But, you know, if that is an issue, here it is. It's going to be quieter now. I'm curious what they did to make it quieter. I'm, I'm wondering if, like, maybe the buttons are, like, smaller or something. It's more smoothed out or maybe the um, I don't know what they're called, but the actual button it like the 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 thing clicks into. Maybe that's quiet. I don't know. Sustainability. Do good. Feel good. Rechargeable and swappable battery. Hmm. Not terrible. I hate so everyone always was complaining. I it always bothered me so much. It bothered me so much. Oh, why doesn't the Xbox have a rechargeable battery built in? I would always say I readily I always use PlayStation 5. Again, I love PlayStation. 5. I'm not one of these guys console warring. Please. I know I know you achievers know that, but just in case this is your first video I've ever, ever seen me, or maybe this is a short or something. I promise. I, I love both, but I never liked the PS5 controllers because you can never swap the batteries out. You can never, it, it's, it never felt like they were good, they would hold charges well in these things. And it just always irked me. Now, at least for those people who always complain about rechargeable batteries, just 
again, you just buy the the batteries that Microsoft sells. I know Sticker Shock, it's another 25 bucks on top of the controller, but the batteries were 1 billion times better than the PS5 batteries because with the PS5, I feel like this thing's dying all the time. Anyways, rechargeable and swappable batteries. Cool. I'm glad you were able to swap them. That That's a plus. I like that. Recycled materials and less resin. Repair and disassemble. So I'm assuming it's easily take apartable and fixable and these things. Durable and re reliable. New modular thumbsticks. That's pretty interesting. Improved longevity. Continued build improvements. So just random, you know, they fixed random things. Curious about the new modular thumbstick. So that makes it to where I'm curious if you're able to somewhat fix if you have a thumbstick issue or maybe it's purely for design preference or something. I don't know. Also, if you're audio, the thumbstick is, or sorry, the D-pad is the like more kind of elite controller D-pad kind of thing. Uh, I do like those D-pads. Curious if anyone, uh, let me know in the comments if anyone hates these. I love them because uh, they they feel really nice to like roll if you need to in like a fighting game or something. But also they serve as a good D-pad. I'm going to take a sip. We're going to get to approachability after I take this sip. Please give me one second. Oh, oh there we go. Engage into light. Lift to wake. It's pretty interesting. So I'm assuming if, you know, you do the thing where you set your controller down, you go do something, right? You go do something for your wife, significant other, etc. You know, your, your controller goes to sleep or turns off pretty much to save battery. So I'm assuming there's like a sleep mode for this controller. And the moment you pick it up, it wakes up. That's pretty cool. Very, very cool. Now, remember, they are kind of making this as a seamable experience with your phone and these things to set up a future where that would be more common, probably. So that's some a feature that will probably be welcomed in that platform as well. It ends with familiar Xbox feel. Same ergonomics as Merlin, which I believe is just the, the, the regular Xbox controller that we know right now, not like the original. Same layout and activation, uh, activation forces. S, E, L, E, and X, D, L options as expected. What does that mean? S, E, L. It's not important. And there you have it. That's Sibyle. Not a very great project name, I feel like. But there you go. That's what to expect. You have a cylinder. We have the same Xbox Series S. We have a new controller. To quickly end, after going through all that, I don't know. I, I'm happy to see them. The again, they're, the mid-gen refresh does kind of feel like they're just taking things away and making it smaller and charging you the same price. Don't love that. You do get the new controller with it. But I don't know. I, I just I don't know about this. I don't know. If I had the option right now to buy the Series X as it exists now or this, I would buy the Series X as it is now for the same price. Right. Am I crazy? Let me know if I'm crazy. Comments, tweet at me, however you like. At you know, a thousand if you wanted to at me. I just I don't see. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see the, the appeal for half of this. <coughs> so the path to leadership in gaming is the next thing we're going to be talking about. This was a little thing where. They pretty much have like a path to leadership. They want to be the leader in gaming until fiscal uh, uh, by fin uh, fiscal year thir uh, 30. So 2030. Uh, I don't I don't see how they think that's possible. But but hey, let's talk about it. So this pretty much is in like three waves, right? It's broken up in cloud first, PC first, console first, plus multiple device gamers, and it's all broken up. Right. And there's brackets like each fiscal year is like this, 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 this. Right. So it starts off fiscal year of 2023. That's smart TV app. Then we get to fiscal year 2025. A little bit before is the universal wireless controller and the mid gen consoles. We're currently seeing that right now with the Sabile controller and then the new systems. Then we go from there to fiscal year between 28 and 29 gen 10. So their new system, right? And then uh, 530. And then they have an expected Xbox Game Pass subscribers. So that's your Y axis, 
of this graph and then the x axis x x axis will be the fiscal year right so your horizontal and your vertical your vertical is your game pass subscribers your horizontal is your um fiscal year right it tops the charts out at 120 million subscribers, which is okay, whatever. And the and the lowest, of course, zero. And we already talked about where the year starts. So by the time fiscal year 2030 is happening, they want over a hundred million Xbox Game Pass subscribers. So in seven years, a little less than a decade. They want to quadruple. Yeah, quadruple, pretty much. You could say triple. Because remember, at the beginning of the show, we talked about the 30 million number. They're around 30 million right now. You could triple that. Still technically not enough, so you kind of have to quadruple it. And that's what they want. They want times four of the amount of subscribers by 2030. I'm not going to sit here and say that is impossible. But I want to remind people about something very, it was a while ago now. If we remember a Sean Layden interview that he discussed pretty much, he was asked about what he thinks about Game Pass and these things. And he pretty much had the understanding that, yeah, this thing is like losing them a lot of money as far as he understands. That's pretty much like, not an exact quote, but that's pretty much what he was getting at. And for that thing to be profitable slash sustainable for what they're doing, they would need to have a hundred million subscribers. And lo and behold, lo and behold, that is the goal. 100 million subscribers, a little more technically, about 110 million, because it looks about halfway up that 100 million to 120 million graph. So by 2030, they want about 110 million subscribers to Xbox Game Pass. Look who was right. Sean Layden yet again. I, I love when that man talks because he knows what he's talking about. We talked about him last week on the show. The man knows what he's talking about. He's a very smart man. And look, look, look where we are. That is the goal. A hundred million subscribers. I can't say I'm shocked because I was if you just do the math and try to figure out like I should do a whole episode where we just tra- let's math out Game Pass. Right. And I and let's sit down. Estimates for each studio, their headcount, how much everyone's paid, projects, etc. How much does Game Pass need to make for it to be profitable? Right. So it's making thirty million now. And if we just do the easy math of saying thirty million, and then let's say it averages to ten dollars per person, that's three billion a month, or something like that. Right. Thirty million. If they're paying 10, which that isn't how it's happening because they had the dollar thing where everyone like got ultimate for a year or whatever. So it, that's not equal, but I'm sure that's close to being over soon. Anyway, it's not important. But if we do, uh, it's not three, three, three billion, by the way, it's 300 million uh, a month. Uh, I can't believe I said that. 30 billion to 10 by times 10 is just 300 million. Sorry, that was a gross math error. Uh, anyways. It shows you, and again, there were three brackets, by the way. Console first was like, is, I, w- I would say 38 million-ish people. PC first gamers is like, I would say what, 10 million? And then cloud first starts very small, which is like, what is this? At this point, it would be less than 5 million people, something like that, at this point in the timeline, like where we are. No, wait, way less than that, like like a million, 2 million. So they expect all this to grow, right, over over this time span of, of course, we're pretty much at the beginning of the graph. We're going all the way over. We, we expect giant growths in every aspect of the market, which, of course, is how capitalism works, right? You expect giant growths or... Uh, something's not working, right? Anyways, I thought that was quite interesting. This graph is... It says a lot of, of what their plans are. They they really th- they really think, and I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm just saying this is what they think. They think they will times four their, per, their current subscriber base, which is, I mean, ambitious to say the least in seven years. 
they clearly have a plan right now. I would love to see more, more, more. And look at that. We're going to talk more and more and more. Uh, they have mid-gen goals. Address customer feedback. Increase storage on Series S. Rechargeable, removable controller batteries. XDL for consoles. Is that... um? I think that's like developer stuff. We're, we're, let's look. What, what is X... DL in gaming. I can't remember what this is. It's not giving me what it is. It's giving me DLC. I think I miswrote DLC. And no, I don't know. It's fine. I'm pretty sure it's it's development tools. Maintain technology, leadership, and innovation. All new Series X design, all digital ecosystem. Isn't that important? They want an all digital ecosystem, right? Internal document, mid gen goals. They want an all digital platform saying what they want for everything. An all digital ecosystem. They they don't want you buying physical games. That's something that I feel like is not discussed a lot in the Xbox ecosystem, really by anyone. I feel like um, I'm not sitting here pretending like I know it, what everyone's discussing. Just my cursory glance on like my Twitter and Reddit and these things. It, I just don't see people discussing that much that Xbox very much does not want you to buy physical games. And I mean, they don't want you really having any disc at all in your collection. They want to transform them into an all digital ecosystem focus purely on a no disc, all digital platform. Which is crazy that they want to be that quick with it. Now, technically, this is mid-gen goals, and we're not talking about the fu future of the system yet. But it is interesting to note. And then, of course, it is one of those things where I'm sure it's not crazy to think about, right? The people who want you to subscribe to a subscription service where you don't own anything don't want you to own games. I mean, of course. Of course. I'm not sitting here being like, what? Right? Like. It makes sense. It's just to see it written out, to know that it's coming very quickly is something completely different, I think. Let's move on. Up to 80% reduced power in standby. Wi-Fi 6E for faster downloads. En enable richer gaming experiences. Direct to cloud controller. Get into games quicker with extra IO lanes. Reduce developer friction. Fast controller charging via front USB port. Seems interesting that that's on there. So, uh, okay, I mean, that's pretty common, but all right. Drive growth and competitiveness on console. MSRPs and distribution flex uh, flexibility. Um, manufacturer suggested retail price is MSRP, just as a reminder, meaning a flexibility on, like, what could the pricing be on, I'm assuming, their ecosystem of systems? So... The way I read that, let me know if I'm wrong in the comments. They want to make it more expensive so that the manufacturers can leverage sales better. Food for thought. Multiple storage options for broader access. Refreshed ID plus more sustainable materials. Bluetooth radio enables more third-party accessories. I don't really care about third-party accessories. I don't remember the last time I used anything third-party on any of my systems. Just not a fan of them. I don't think I have anything really to add with any of this. This all I, I talked about what I really want to discuss, and we've talked about what we had before. Um, this is the voice. We're not care. We don't care about any of that. This is a this is a a, a little bit of a better timeline, I would say. I'm gonna quickly show this on the screen, um, just so we know a little bit better about what timelines we were discussing earlier. So this is the launch timelines of what they expect for pretty much everything that we've been talking about, right? So the new controllers announced fiscal year Q4 of 2024, right? So pretty much holiday time, it's announced, and then it launches at $69.99. So pretty much the, not pretty much, the price of the PS5 controller, right? Launches in this, May, June timeline. Oh, wait, no. Of the. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, fiscal year Q4 timeline. So, it's 
announced and released pretty quickly. And then the Xbox Gaming Week mid-gen consoles announced in June of fiscal year 2024. And then, what does that say? Elwood and Brooklyn announced simultaneously. So, of course, they wouldn't announce both consoles. Then we get to July, which is the beginning of fiscal year 2025. So, this is all announced. Sebio launches very quickly, right? And then we move on to the consoles, which I'll be curious. I'm curious why they don't do all this at once. Maybe they want you to buy more. They probably want you to buy more controllers. And then they announce the new consoles. Then you buy the consoles included with the controllers. Then we move on until August. So near end of August is when the Series S launches, right? And then we're moving from that to the Brooklyn launches at the end of October for $4.99. All, you know, all the same prices. Additional storage options announced and available fiscal year of 2025 H2. I don't know what H2 is. I don't know. And then some wording here. 60 day plus separation between launches enables dialogue with different audiences allows us to focus on new improvements in Sabile, tell stories between consoles adds value to Brooklyn and Elwood at announce gives Elwood its own moment earlier in the holiday time frame to maximize sales last chance Edith 512 gigabyte at 199 as Black Friday offer before end of life very interesting Starkville end of life ahead of Brooklyn launch. So we know that they're, they're going to be ending the, both of them. Brooklyn arrives just in time for gifting season, but separate from Elwood. So they'll be doing last chance offers for the 512 uh, gigabyte series S as a 199. So only 200 bucks. You'll be able to pick it up on black Friday by that time. And that'll be the end of life for that system as the kind of last hurrah. Starkville, Starkville, I am assuming, is the Xbox Series S. That ends right ahead of... So they probably just stopped manufacturing. A little bit before um, Brooklyn is coming out. Interesting, to say the least. Crazy to see these timelines so well right now. And it, it it's not really that far, if we're being honest, right? This is All we're really doing is talking about like a year and a half. But it's just crazy to see, right? And that what makes this leak so special. Uh, let's see. So this is another like, oh, this is a mid gen thing. So we've already talked about a lot about the Xbox Series S and X and the Series X and the Xbox developer tools thing. We also talked about Sebi a lot. This is just covering a lot of that. Uh, the Xbox Universal controller is just, uh, they're also going to be doing that in the Xbox kind of developer thing as well. That's just more of this. So we're going to be skipping some of that. Let's see. Pop, 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 pop. So mid gen fiscal year 2025 27 scenarios. So deliver full Fairhaven vision, new storage option, refresh ID, fully featured Sabile. So Fairhaven, I believe, is the is all the consoles, like what you would call them put together, pretty much. Like they're there. And then let's see. If they're going to refresh the elite line of controllers, I believe, is what this means at the bottom here. And then enable grow cloud growing points, pare down no elite business. Limited attached to cloud end points. They also have volume estimates, which is very interesting. OK, moving on, because there wasn't much there. Let's see. Current gaps in fiscal 2020 to reach 2030. So this is, yeah, okay, let's get this. So they're, they have certain things that they want to hit, right? So they have gaps that they want to hit so that they can get to their 2030 goal of like 100 um, Game Pass subscribers and uh, the current leader of gaming is what they said. So what they have ready, of, of course, cloud console keystone which we've heard a million times gen 10 investigations which i'm assuming just means like what people want for the next generation after nine mid-gen consoles wireless headset called park view core controller is sabio of course um sw security just increased security xbox design lab and se and l E for mid-gen controllers that's called project ingrain i believe that's for like more developer kits in these things not currently funded this is a bracket it's pretty much a pyramid actually i can show this why am i not just showing you this 
there you go. This is not currently funded slash resource. So like this is things that they want to do, but they're just not planned out or paid for yet. Right. So a lead controller at the very tip top. I'm assuming this is a new one. And then there's a luxury controller called Project Zerase. Console customization via XDL, which again, I'm pretty sure is development kits. PC accessories, accessibility portfolio, new cloud server blade, repairability and sustainability progress, audio portfolio expansion, and then not in scope for first party. So these things that just are not going to happen. Earbuds, media remote, mobile controller, yeah, and handheld. That's important. That's important to bring up now because we need to discuss that in a second. Did we skip that actually? Yeah. So we're actually going to go back. I heard you, you know, at the very tip top of that thing was not in scope for first party, a handheld. Now, there was a little thing that was leaked that was the lineup. Yeah. So Xbox Gaming Today, pretty much. And it's like everything they have. And then they it's pretty much everything you expect now. And then Xbox Gaming Beyond. And it's a bunch of possibilities, pretty much. Right. Let me show you. Boom. Now, this one's like a lot smaller. So or a lot bigger. Almost done. Cut a lot of that out. Sorry about that. OK. This is Xbox Gaming Beyond. So right now, the, the and I'm going to read everything because they have a they have a lot of this but anyway browser mobile android and ios smart tvs low end mid pcs you know they already do all this uh third party streaming sticks and set top boxes so they want to make sure they get to like your rokus and these things cloud device this would be project keystone handheld so this is some sort of, sort of handheld that they i'm assuming have r and d and clearly they have already made but reminder on that pyramid out of scope so they don't seem a need to make this themselves, right? Steam Deck is already kind of doing that for them, especially if they open up more tools to the Steam Deck. Then they have consoles, high-end PCs, Cloud Blade. And then at the bottom, they have a one-hand controller, mobile controller, audio core, premium, elite, gaming keyboard and mouse. So remember, we talked about all these different things of what they wanted to do, and these things are not what they're quite interested in it doesn't mean they're interested in any of this it's just a lot of this they're not interested in specifically remember we saw the mobile controller on there specifically and that handheld that just that's just not in the scope for what they want to do and they're just going to leave that to third party people to make who knows what what they want and what they do want i don't really have much to speculate on this of i'm not i mean of course you know why why would they want a handheld to me so like to me i would want a handheld if it's ser if it serves like a steam deck situation but you would have to argue like would they want to make a steam deck when one already exists so is that something they even want to do i don't know but that's not something i'm i feel like needs to exist in the xbox platform because i have my phone so it's not really that big a deal to me anyways it's that time again it's time to sip. Okay. Every now and then a sip of water just like makes you feel like you like you're seeing God. Let's see here. Nothing crazy. There's so many documents. So I'm just quickly going through some of this. Okay. I found something that is not substantially talked about, so I'm going to try and find the actual one that we'll talk about. So, here's a couple of things. One, I wanted to discuss a thing that was leaked that shows pretty much the most engaged Xbox games on the platform. Uh, and I don't think any of this is really a shock to really anyone, but I thought it was interesting to at least talk about. There we go. Okay. So this is from CY15 to CY19. What does that mean? I keep I keep forgetting what that means. Top 20 most engaged Xbox franchises. So this is the top 20 most engaged Xbox franchises. They use the metrics total hours played, monthly average users, and average annual playtime. Now, a lot of this is not going to be shocking, I think, to anyone. But 
th just the sheer numbers is pretty crazy. So this is from, again, the, oh, I think it's complete year, meaning not fiscal. So it's from January to December of 2015, January and December to 2019. So let's re really, let's really suck in some of these numbers. So at number 20, we have Red Dead Redemption. Number 19, Rocket League. Number 18, Gears of War. Number 17, Overwatch. Number 16, Roblox. Number 15, Elder Scrolls. Number 14, Assassin's Creed. Number 13, Fallout. Number 12, Halo. Number 11, Battlefield. Number 10, Forza. Number 9, Madden NFL. Number 8, Tom Clancy's. Number 7, Destiny. Number 6, Minecraft. Number 5, NBA 2K. Number 4, Grand Theft Auto. Number 3, FIFA. Number 2, Call of Duty. And number one, you guessed it, Fortnite. Now, let's go over some of these numbers. because Some of these numbers are very, very interesting. One, just to show you how big of a deal just Red Dead Redemption is. And again, we're talking about 2015 to 2019 here. Uh, total hours played was 900 million. Uh, and the monthly average users was 900. Uh, uh, sorry, sub, so that that would not be a million. So that would be 900,000 monthly users. And the average annual playtime is 231, which is pretty nuts. That's just for a single-player game. Not to, eh. I mean, eh, no, it, ha it has online, but not important. Or, no, would, would this count Red Dead 2? When did Red Dead 2 come out? It's 2019, right? Red Dead Redemption 2. Why is it listed as a survival game on here? What is wrong with people? 2018. So it does. It does. It, it does count this. For, I thought it was 2019. But so it does count Red Dead 2. Again, this is franchises. You have to remember franchises, not single titles, right? So this is, of course, including Red Dead 2. And remember, this is making up the difference in ranking in 20 by only being out in two years. Pretty much one year because it launched like at, I think it was October of 20 of uh, 2018 so like a year and like a few months and it hit rank 20 Oof. Uh, a couple interesting things elder scrolls another single player game a full single player no online 1.4 uh, 1.4 billion hours played 1.3 million monthly average users and an average playtime of 262 i think is what that says yeah a little blurry. And Fallout, 1.4 billion hours played, 1.6 monthly after you. I mean, and all the and those two Zenimax things are highlighted, I believe, because obviously they were like, we're gonna buy them, so let's highlight them. You know, this is why we're buying them. Uh, and we'll have this now. Now let's get to the top five. Because I think this is where it really gets insanity. And it shows how strong these these franchises are. So number five, as a reminder, was NBA 2K. This is made by Take Two, of course. Total hours played is four billion. Monthly average users is three point five million, and the average annual playtime is two hundred and eighty-five. I mean, that's just that's just unreal. That's the fifth one, by the way, and they have all those numbers. Grand Theft Auto Five, Take Two. I thought this would be higher, to be honest, but of course, FIFA is huge in Europe, huge, huge, and of course, it's huge in America as well. And I, I did think Grand Theft Auto would be higher than Call of Duty, but it's still this high. And as a reminder, it's Grand Theft Auto V, and it was never re-released in a, like... That's not true. It was re-released on, like, Xbox Series like X and these things for, like, enhancements. But it was it, it never had, like, a full reveal. So it's just really Grand Theft Auto V. Remember, it's a 2013 game. It didn't release multiple things like FIFA and Call of Duty did. So this is one game. 6.4 hours uh, in billion total playtime. What does that say? Monthly average users is 6.9 million. And then the average playtime, 233. I mean, these are just insane. This is insanity. It's just, it released once. Technically twice. Technically three times. But that's not important. Not important. Pretty crazy. It's the same game, pretty much. I mean, you could say, like, oh, you know, it has first person mode. It's the same game, though. It's just crazy. FIFA. 
This is, of course, EA. 6.6 6 billion uh, hours of playtime. 6.7 monthly average. You just insanity. Average annual playtime is 247. Call of Duty, 9.9 .9 billion hours. 11.4 monthly average users. It's just an insane amount. And then 219 average annual playtime. Shows you how hardcore NBA 2K players are, by the way. Fortnite. Epic Games. 10.9 billion hours. 12.8 monthly average users and 212 average annual playtime. Now... There are a couple of outliers I want to quickly discuss, namely Destiny. Destiny's at number seven. With average annual playtime, 420. Average annual playtime per monthly average user. That is... Gamers are playing Destiny. Like, people who are, like, sitting down. That is their game. That is just insane. Insane. How high that is. My God. Oh, my God. That is just crazy. I think that's everything I need with Game Pass. Let me quickly go over, like, everything here. And there's just so much. Anyways. Uh, more documents. This one, actually, I found from Stephen Still because it is so much. He actually just did a write-up that I'm going to read. Um, that's very good, but I do want to make sure everyone goes and clicks this. Uh, this is over on Axio by Stephen Still. Very, very I, I love Stephen Till. He, uh, he's always dropping bangers. Now, Microsoft leak reveals cost estimates of bringing big releases to Game Pass. Major video game publishers want 100 million to 300 million to put their games on Game Pass on the day they also go on sale, according to leaked internal estimates by Microsoft. Now they do like brackets pretty much like why it matters the economics around game pass microsoft's popular all you can play gaming service with 25 million subscribers have been lacking in hard figures but an unprecedented leak of course uh let's get and let's skip all that state of play in a may 16th email xbox corporate vice president sarah braun broke down 18 possible third-party games to pursue for game pass noting the expected cost for getting them Bond's team estimated that securing Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed Rift, which would later be, of course, Assassin's Creed Mirage for a day and day Game Pass debut, would cost $100 million. Bond described that option as one of Microsoft's most cost effective paths, though that was when the game was expected in early 2023. And it was, of course, later delayed to October. And of course, it is not launching a Game Pass currently. Microsoft estimated that EA would ask for $300 million for a Game Pass day and date launch of Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Bond said it would be, quote, a crown jewel, but at what cost, end quote, would not be good return on investment. <laughs> nah, no shit. Now, this is what's pretty crazy. Other potential deals included an estimate Five million dollars for a day and date launch of Baldur's Gate 3. The Royal Playing Game was a breakout hit, of course, that summer that back uh that back in May 2022. Of course, it, it re-sparked its hit when it launched uh this year. The Microsoft team labeled it as a quote second run stadia RPG, end quote. Yikes! The game had once been planned as a marquee release for uh Google Shuttered Stadia service, of course. Wow. Quite the misestimate. Five million dollars. Nothing. Pennies. They could have got the end date. Very interesting. The company also estimated the expected cost of putting Grand Theft Auto on Game Pass at 12 to 15 million a month. Grand Theft Auto 5 was added to Game Pass in June of 2023. Of course, we don't know the deal, but you can argue that she's pretty close. This is pretty much this is her job. So as long as she's doing her job correctly, these are pretty much what they're going to ask for. Let's see here. And this is but this is called Between the Lines. This is the section of the article. Bond's breakdown of Game Pass options followed an early May 2022 note from Xbox Gaming Chief Phil Spencer, who said the company was facing, quote, a disaster situation, end quote, regarding its gaming lineup. The company's expected marquee release of the late 22 was Starfield. That was pushed. Of course, Redfall didn't have a date, so that was pushed as well. And then Stalker 2 was ready to go, but then that was delayed, of course, because of the Ukraine war. And that would be pretty much everything I wanted to bring up from this specific article. This is, of course, 
yes, this is everything I wanted to talk about. So there you go. Let's move on to, let's see. This was just an interesting insight. So here's an email that really goes to show you like how confident you can be when you're kind of in a vacuum. This is a, a tweet from Tron Warner. This is how I found it. Microsoft thought it would have a 30% GPU performance advantage over PS5. Xbox chief Phil Spencer was nervous about the PS5 unveil. So there's multiple things. So here's one thing from, from an email. Details. Mark Cerny, PS5 architect, walk through the design approach to their consoles, balancing developer familiarity with innovation. He emphasized that GPU, teraflops, and CU is not a good measure of performance. We made the same point with Digital Foundry, but we do have a clear performance advantage. 12 versus 10. We also dedicate significant time to their boost mode, where their GPU and GPU run in variable frequencies, which require them to build a custom cooling solution. We ex uh, explicitly rejected this design, and it is a significant challenge for developers and effective performance is expected to be lower than these boost clock metrics. We expect that we'll have a 30% advantage on GPU performance in a 25% memory bandwidth advantage in terms of real world performance. Cerny talked at length about the move to SSDs and the advantages for game developers and consumers. They have optimized for raw, higher, raw throughput, two times ours, with slightly better hardware compression and associated performance improvements as opposed to a more integrated streaming architecture enabled by sampler feedback streaming. Their approach to expansion is different from ours. We have a custom expansion card while they're using a more standard NVMe M.2 SSD slot. No existing drives to meet their required performance or physical form factor constraints, but in long term, their approach may provide price advantage, which it does. Cerny also spent what seemed like a disproportionate amount of time on audio inventions, innovations and we believe we have similar capabilities i do remember that certainly talk he did spend a lot on audio specifically and i do feel like i have noticed a difference in audio in this generation but i did also upgrade my uh, audio experience so it's hard to say what is that and what is like them improving it. who knows i will say dead on with their MVME.2 solution, right? No existing drives. And I remember that no drive on their market currently met their performance and physical form factor at the time PS5 announced this. Of course, that was irrelevant at the time. And I remember that being like somewhat of an issue, but like people will just make it and, and like it will get to that point. It's not that big a deal. And they say here, no existing drives met it. But in the long term, their approach may provide price advantage, and it does. You can buy a one terabyte card for incredibly cheap. And on the Xbox side, of course, they went proprietary. They have a card in it. It is nowhere near as cheap. I've se I bought one. It was a one terabyte for less than a hundred bucks, like at the beginning of this year, I believe. I think it was sixty bucks on sale or something crazy like that. And it was a whole, and it was a one terabyte drive and I've seen it for like a hundred bucks for two terabytes and you'll never see that for the Xbox. Oh, you will. I should say you would very rarely see that for the proprietary drive. They are starting to get better now with introducing Western digital cards in these things, but too little too late in my opinion, as we've already seen that, that advantage that PlayStation has, but you do have an ease of use case for Xbox because you could just pop it in there whereas playstation you have to pop open the slate take off a thing screw something in click it in all these things so there's pros and cons to both but at the end of the day it's hard to say that ps5s wasn't the way to go because it's just you just saved so much more money that way uh, as a consumer of course not including them and of course microsoft made more money with the situation that they went with of course so it is a pros and cons, and we don't know how much money that they grossed from that with having an exclusive deal with Seagate, which then expanded to Western Digital, and then I'm, I'm assuming they get price cuts from all this anyways. Next up, here's an email. This is to Amy Hood and Sati Nabella from Phil Spencer. Even as I type this, and again, this is uh, March 18th, 2020, so this is the beginning of the year. This is right as uh, PS5's big reveal. 
uh, right, right around that time. Easy enough to type this. I know I shouldn't, but I can't help myself. We've all lived with seven years of starting off a generation with a price and performance and messaging disadvantage to PS4 and Xbox One. I have to admit, this morning when I woke up knowing the PS5 reveal was today, that the stress level was higher than normal. Now, after almost 12 hours of soaking in their unveil, taking apart their specs, and looking at the community response, I just wanted to say that I'm proud of our team. We have a better product than Sony does, not just on hardware, but equally important on the software platform and services on top of the hardware. We have the ingredients of a winning plan. I felt the feedback from the board of directors discussion on uh, being too confident, and maybe this will just reinforce that perception. I get the need to be humbly confident, but today was a good day for us. We haven't won anything, and I know we have a hard discussion about pricing, P&L, investments, etc. Uh, profit and loss, by the way, is P&L. This mail isn't trying to scoop any of that. Those decisions really matter, but we can take confidence in our product truth here, and I do believe any conversation needs to start with believing in that. This was a good day for Xbox. Thanks for indulging me, Phil. Oof. None of that mattered in the end. Even if all that's true, which I believe it is. Um, at least from my point of view, I, I'm not very tech knowing. But as far as I understand, Xbox is a stronger platform. Um, very marginally so. And it doesn't seem to matter because I haven't seen big disparities between the two games. So it doesn't seem to matter. And whatever... Whenever it does matter, we also have to remember we have to bring up the Xbox Series S being this kind of weight on the Series X. This figurative thing that's kind of holding back some games from even launching on the Series X to begin with. So it's hard to really sit down and be like, yeah, no, you did win that there. I, I, I would say like he was probably right about a lot of that, but it didn't end up mattering. You're still losing two to one. Maybe less than that. I don't know. We have to kind of guess. They're not saying their numbers, so it's not good, especially in comparison. So I don't know. I don't really have much to add there, but it's just. I don't know. He seems so confident. Why? I don't know. Why were you that confident in that? Interesting. Let's see here. Um, and then there is a zero. So there is a kind of a funny graph that says from zero Microsoft to one Microsoft. So in the 2001, they have the Xbox and they have from low to full and this kind of like bar thing. And it goes from standalone hardware and software to dev tooling to OS and SDK convergence, cloud optimized hardware, unified GDK, and then a full convergence. And each thing is separated by Xbox, Xbox 360, Xbox One, Xbox Series S and X, and then next gen sometime in 2000 and 2000 in 2028. Whew. That is a lot of what I have. Now, I want to say I missed a few things. So I'm going to quickly go to the master things that I have. I have like a Twitter thing. I have like a couple articles I've been looking at. So let's see. This was interesting. So Phil Spencer was talking about gaming studio closures. And in the specific case, the uh, uh, he's talked about uh, gaming closures are quote almost always end quote because of quote leadership leaving Lionhead was using an example or team losing his pension and of course ensemble was used as that example so here it is this is um from Phil Spencer in March 19 2021 two things so I'm, I'm gonna read that for uh, pretty much verbatim I don't think we've ever closed a studio due to studios P&L so profit and loss. It's almost always been either from leadership leaving, as Lionhead as an example, or team just losing as, as its passion ensemble, as an, as an example. And then this is from the exchange from Gene Emile Elion. My turn to say, honestly, I don't know. I don't really know what goes into closing a studio. How much funding versus personnel versus output feeds into the decision in my mind if a studio completely needs to prove their worth by being a by being net value over their cost it adds a ton of pressure to release hits on a regular basis if a game is a niche though too bad this is not armchair quarterbacking i swear i'm just super worried about the moat you've built that the winds will change and we have a bloodbath a few years down the road especially given our pure cloud companions companies sorry underestimating of the game creation process and Quote, but by the God of grace, go we, end quote. Not my job. I appreciate so training. So trying to train my mental mo model on how to think about the content side of the house. 
to not be worried, especially where the economics has changed with Game Pass. Let me see if I can partner software architect at Xbox. It's like, yes. That is who that is. They're discussing pretty much. I find it very interesting, right? This is not an arm trick or a bag, but I'm worried about the moat you've built, that the winds will change and we will have a bloodbath a few years down, down the road. I mean, I think it's quite possible. Sorry if you heard that. That was my phone. I feel like it is quite possible where we find a solu uh, situation where we see ourselves. We see ourselves. Xbox sees itself in a situation where they just bleed talent everywhere. And that's just what's going to happen when you have these fat paychecks given out so much like these people are going to leave because they're going to go retire or make a new studio. Right. I In a few years, everyone's going to leave Bethesda. Right. All the people you like, all the people names, I'm almost positive. Just about everyone's probably going to leave. Right. So it's hard to disagree with a lot of that. Uh, Activism Blizzard, I think, is going to be a. A case of. I think Jim Ryan, what he said in that email that was leaked is very true. Once all these contracts are done, people are going with their parachutes. They're getting out of there, right? All the talent that you just paid for, you know, you're only going to have that for so long unless you figure out a way of keeping these people. I just don't see that happening. But, you know, hey, maybe maybe it will happen. I don't know. I had to take the dog out. Weird cut there. I'm sorry, but we do have a little bit more to talk about. I didn't know I went on for this long. I feel like there's going to be a lot of rambling, so I apologize for that. But let's talk about the uh, new Xbox a little bit more uh, as we close out, because I feel like we didn't substantially talk about it, or at least talk about it enough. Uh, and this is a full article from Sean Hol Hollister. Let's see here. It's fire the head. Okay, here we go. So this is everything we've talked about. Uh, power is a plus. Yeah, so company imagine you playing these games using a combined power of a sub $99 gadget, possibly a handheld and its X called platform simultaneously. So remember, this is the 2028 next gen. They're they're seeing it as almost like an app platform where you can uh, play it from anywhere. You can buy something for a hundred bucks and be able to play whatever game you want, right? And they want the they 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 clearly want to use this kind of Azure platform they have to get the cloud up to scale to the point where they can have gaming pretty much anywhere, as long as you have some sort of device that can stream it to you, right? Either a ninety nine dollar handheld or your phone or et cetera, et cetera. And of course, with the low low price of an Xbox Game Pass subscription, right? Um. Pretty much everything. Um, here we go. If it's happening, it may already be happening. The team suggested it would need to ink partnerships with AMD for the Silicon by the first quarter of this year to lock down the company's Navi 5 graphics. For reference, we're only on Navi 3 right now, as well as potentially nabbing the company's Zen 6 CPU cores. It's also considering ARM. So we, are, we talked about that earlier. Microsoft suspected it would also need an MPU. This is not something I knew earlier. Machine Learning AI co-processor to provide a wider variety of benefits, including super resolution, latency compensation, frame rate interpolation, and more. Uh, and then this is next generation gaming. Uh, and this is an internal document. Um, game performance, super resolution, deep neural network, frame rate interpolation, X cloud latency compensation, AI agents, codex, and RL base. These are a bunch of wordy things. I'm going to skip this because it doesn't really give much context to anything. Uh, let's see. Journey has already started. It, yeah, this is, we already talked about this. But before that, according to another side, the company needed to make some key decisions on that silicone alignment of building a thin operating system to run the local parts of those cloud games, which teams would be responsible and which hardware it would build to go with. It is very possible none of that happened just as Microsoft abandoned its dedicated X Cloud SKU, if we remember that. If you ever partnering with other providers, I said, and said, remember that was kind of Project Keystone kind of thing where it just never really happened. Um, let's see. Yeah. So according to leaked documents, the pitch appears to have come out of a major ongoing conversation among Xbox top leadership, including the CEO, Satya Nadella, Xbox, Phil Spencer, Windows device and operating 
system leader Pen Pen Panos Pene Panai, I believe, X Cloud CVP Kareem Chudri, and more. Quote, we are building four types of computer. One, cloud everything. Two, a hybrid Xbox. Three, hybrid Windows. And four, hybrid HoloLens, wrote Nadella. According to leaked documents, quote, we need to bring the company systems talent together to align on a unified vision. And quote, we can't go from a big idea to a big idea. We need to. We need a single big idea to rally the company around. Uh, he writes. Uh, in another documentation, he dubbed a roadmap for 2030, and we already discussed all that. And I'm pretty sure we're nearing pretty much the end of everything I wanted to really talk about. Um, we talked about pretty much the most egregious things, uh, game development. Yeah, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to discuss. I did find two things. Um, I did look at some things while I was outside that I wanted to bring back up. I couldn't find while we were discussing it. So I wanted to quickly bring up now before we um, depart from each other for the week. Uh, so this is about... Oh, so this is the document talking about uh what would cause someone game pass now the document is cut off and it's using imager and i'll be honest i don't know how to use this site uh so we're just going to do wait hold on i found the source can i scroll oh i can't i can't cool perfect okay so to end we're gonna end on this this is the sarah bond email we referenced earlier right uh but instead of referencing it we're just gonna go straight into and discussing like so we have a better idea of how much a lot of these games are going to cost, right? So uh, let's start with the uh, number one on the list, right? So they have multiple kind of cutouts. I'll read to each thing, right? So they have Lego Star Wars. This is again, this is all Game Pass, and these are these are both notes on the title coming to Game Pass and how much it's going to cost, pretty much, and like pretty much the value proposition and these things. WB Lego Star Wars will uh, and has this early date of April twenty two. Um, it has day and date, so that's described by D and D plus one hundred and eighty uh holiday see so 180 meaning i assume the days that it would lock it down for so that would keep it to like holiday i guess um and then likely the close would be low to mid um medium and then the wow factor being medium uh i'm assuming wow factor pretty much being like how big of a deal it is on maybe social media and how much traction they gain i guess so expecting partner ass is 35 million dollars um the wild cards would be pc tech readiness timing is questionable negative crunch culture press will make them not want to push teams unreasonably <laughs> marketing support they'd want marketing the title is doing really well change of guard at discovery next up we have dying light 2 uh this was uh for the q1 this was a day and date for 180 low to medium expectant partner ass was 50 million Wild cards. Can they land PC in time? Have been historically slow at responding and moving. New DLC also launching a holiday could pair well. Uh, Skylines 2 uh, is going to be around... Oh, it doesn't actually have the money for this one. Um, let's see here. Uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. So this is uh, one thing we don't know about. This is for fiscal uh, year 2023 and Q2. Day and date for Gen 9. The... Uh, the um, ex uh, likely the close is very low, uh, meaning in very low chance of it happening. Expectant partner ask five million a month question mark hours is 10, 10 million a month. Meaning I, I assume that's the expected, uh, game time wild cards, doubtful on PC or handle via account linking. Uh, so that is something we now know of. We already pretty much knew that they would port RDR two to current gen consoles just cause that's kind of how they've been doing their kind of bigger marquee releases. So we now have full confirmation that it is coming. A couple other things you can see. Uh, Dragon Ball, the breakers w could hit, uh, and their expected ask was $20 million. Um, no resources to dev PC for day and date or 90. It already passing. So they are really hammer hammering on like, can we both get it on both Xbox and PC game pass? It just doesn't seem likely for a lot of these. Uh, Just Dance, expect a partner range of $5 million. Uh, uh, $5 million. Uh, sorry, my left eye is messing with me. I think it's because I uh, the difference in light when I walked outside and it's freaking out. Um, Return to Monkey Island is one of them. A uh, huge PC nostalgia play, new title for a legendary. Expect a partner range of $5 million, so pretty much nothing. Wreckfest 2, I don't even know why they care about this. Sequel too strong for a Game Pass performer. Expect a partner range from $10 million to $14 million. Sequel too strong. 
Game Pass performer. Maybe it's strong as in like it, it'll be good for the title. I'm cu- I don't know what that is. And then of course Larry and Baldur's Gate three. Uh, this would be for day and date. Second run Stadia PC RPGs <laughs> expected play rate five million dollars. I mean, if they could go back in time, huh? That is incredible. In incredible. Now here's some other interesting ones. WB for Suicide Squad. Uh, this would be a day and day, very low and expected to close. Expected partner ass, $250 million. Hours, $150 million. The wild cards, already a partnership with another competitor. Most likely can't offer us rights wise. They said it would be multiples B for B price, uh, back for blood price. Change of guard at Discovery makes sell in motion new. So it makes like a, a more new approach. Star Wars Jedi, we talked about that earlier. That was $300 million insanity. Uh, Mortal Kombat. That would have been two hundred and fifty million wild cards. Crown Jewel, they won't do change of guard at Discovery. Like, there's zero chance of that happening, which is smart that they know that. Obviously, uh, it looks like that's pretty much all we wanted to quick. I wanted to really discuss. We talked about all that. Gotham Knights was up there for fifty million dollars. A lot of WB stuff. A lot of things where it's like, yeah, uh, WB, you want to help us here? Uh, so lots, lots more. Just. That's I think that's going to be I think that's where I'm going to call it that I there's still so much that I want to talk about, but this has ballooned to an almost two hour conversation. And I'm sure you all know, uh, I I think I've given the breadth of what I can talk about here uh, in depth. I hope this has been a learning experience for you. This is I've learned quite a bit. Uh, this is, I think, without a doubt, the biggest Xbox um, leak of all time. I don't think off the top of my head anything really rivals it. Uh, I would have to uh, go through the history to really think about it, but I can't imagine anything being quite as big as this. Uh, but we did learn a lot. We learned that they are looking at things in a purely digital platform much quicker than I thought. I did think we were going to have a few years before they really wanted to stamp down on consoles and these things i will say uh while i was outside i did see a tweet from phil spencer i i I've, i should probably say verbatim what he says i was going to surmise but it's pretty important via the nature of what we're talking about that we actually you know he has commented on it so i should talk about it so i apologize i am on my phone but it is to find this phil spencer thing it's just going to be quicker uh so this is what he tweets out 43 minutes ago as of recording uh we've seen the conversations around old emails and documents it's hard to see our team's work shared in this way because so much has changed and there's so much to be excited about right now and in the future we will share the real plans when we are ready so not much there he's pretty much saying like hey you know things change not everything is is concrete in those emails but you know we'll share things curious what he's specifically talking about who knows i mean he can't tell us what he's talking about so we have to pretty much just move on and be like hey you know a lot of this could change a lot of this is set in stone a lot of this is probably uh good to go etc who knows what's what uh i just love every time we hear about microsoft it's them wanting to buy something i mean half of this was them just discussing like we should buy this and this and this and this and and so it's always so funny to to see like how how much of a different culture they have it's just purely we have money let's spend it to manipulate the market in some way right anyways i find i found everything quite interesting i hate that the i think they're really going to lose even more when the next mid-gen refresh coming because we are getting a ps5 slim with no disk drive it doesn't look really any different it just looks like the ps5 digital it's slightly smaller we are we, there was a leaked video in manufacturing of them someone drawing it off it barely looks any smaller i if i imagine it's a little bit it, it's it's a quite a bit smaller width wise of course you're losing that disk drive the height i imagine is a bit smaller but aside from that it looks the exact same to me at least and uh if we have a ps5 pro coming very soon it seems no no word i mean we know their internal documents very 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 uh clearly now it they have no mid-gen refresh in terms of power their mid-gen refresh uh, amounts to them saving money, making the system smaller and charging you the exact same amount of money, right? You see, we're seeing none of the, uh, we're seeing none of the savings, right? The Microsoft is making more money, uh, not us. So that is a, uh, quite a bit of shame, uh, because, uh, in all metrics, we are losing something and we're being paid the, or, or it's costing the exact same. Whereas PlayStation, I can't imagine they're not going to have that PS4, uh, five slim at a good price of four ninety nine, And that just is not more of an tantalizing offer versus going for the series S and, and going for that. But 
who knows? That's something that we're talking about. And also those are two different audiences. Uh, that's something that might not matter in the end, but they do seem to be on the back foot still. And it's hard to see that they, that they seem to, hmm. Xbox has almost always been on the back foot since Xbox one's launch, obviously. And seeing them with all this, it seems like they're trying to change the game versus play it versus uh, to PlayStation, right? They want to change how the game is played versus trying to beat at what PlayStation is, is going for. So they're going for mass appeal, mass marketing, mass subscription servicing, and all these things. I'll be very curious to see how that works out as we're seeing the collapse of subscription services as we see. And of course, the SAG after strike and all these things of, of these people not being paid what they should be paid. So is that going to be shown in the Xbox ecosystem in a few years? Who knows? Uh, clearly, they have the might and the dollars to push it. But that's in a booming economy. What, what if the belt tightens and they can't s supply a readily um, a ready fund that's constantly being replenished? Who knows? That's just something that we won't know until a reality like that comes to at comes at us. But. I don't know. We have a lot to ponder. I want to thank everyone for joining me this week. This was quite fun. I uh, have quite a bit to c uh, comb through to make this a <laughs> watchable experience as a lot of this was messy. I apologize for that. There'll be a lot of cuts. Uh, hopefully uh, you'll enjoy what I had to say. Um, remember, this is a discussion. You have anything to discuss with me about what I said here? Maybe you disagree. Maybe you agree. I don't know. Comments down below, of course. Uh, I, I respond to every single comment. Every time someone comments, I will... Uh, happily talk with you about anything uh, in this show or something that maybe have developed as I recorded or anything like that. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Remember Twitter at you nine thousand if you like to see the garbage I tweet out uh, every now and then. If you want to support the show, patreoncom achievers is how you can support financially if you'd like. Although I know money is tight everywhere, so only do that if you have the extra bucks. Remember, you just viewing is enough for me. Uh, remember, if you can. Uh, take a few seconds, like, comment, subscribe, maybe share if you uh, have a friend that you'd like to uh, sh kind of share this kind of leak with and, and discuss what your thoughts are on uh, X, Y, and Z. Um, and uh, thank you so much. I can't wait to see you guys again. Uh, I will say I, I'm probably going to just net number this as an Easy Achievers podcast episode. Um, and what I'll do is I'll see if the news picks up enough to justify a uh, Thursday episode, a regularly scheduled Easy Achievers Game Podcast for uh, you all at home. Let me know if that's something you want for sure. Maybe it will just be a digest episode where I, you know, I've had time to sit on this information. And remember, I was very, as soon as I had time, I, I got on to talk with all of you. So I want to remind you all, uh, uh, thank you once more. Um, before I ramble on, I will let everyone go. And remember, until we see you again, go Chief.